So I have <clears throat> muted all the participants. And once we start the session, uh, we shall allow you to unmute yourself and then speak up during the Q&A session specifically. Stay tuned. Yes, sir. Good morning. Thank you for joining in. Yogendra Naik, sir. Good morning. Thank you for joining in. Thank you, Manoj. Yogendra, sir, has joined from Manipal. Hi, Yogendra. Yogendra, sir, you can unmute yourself. Hi, Yogi. How are you? Yeah, yeah, fine, 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 uh, Nitesh. Long Thank time. you. Great to Thank you. Uh, I think, uh, Manoj, uh, thank you very much. Huh? My pleasure, sir. My pleasure. Stay tuned, sir. Thank you so much for joining in. Thank you. Thank you. It's so another few minutes to go. We'll start in, say, next two minutes. It's 10 o'clock, we'll start now. So I welcome all the participants. Thank you so much for joining in. Uh, we have with us our guest speaker, Nitesh sir from Canada. Welcome sir. Thank you for tuning in from Canada, Alberta, Canada at you know late night, it's around 10 o'clock, I think 10, 15 for you. Uh, you are 11 and a half hours you know behind indian time so thank you so much for uh, you know agreeing to share your experience and uh, expertise in job opportunities and career options for students uh, pharmacy students in canada i welcome you sir thank you so much so before we start i'll just give a brief introduction about sir uh, nitesh sir he did his 
uh, M farm from government college of pharmacy. And then he went abroad to practice the profession of pharmacy. He comes with more than 19 years of experience. And currently he is the manager at uh, Walmart Canada. He is an Alberta licensed prescribing pharmacist, a certified diabetes educator, and uh, he is authorized to administer medicines by injections and has a certifi certification in first aid and CPR at level C. So he is an expert in medication reviews, patient care plans, prescription adaptation and extension, administration of medicines by injection, point of care testing, and ordering test, uh, lab tests, opi opioid assessment. He is highly knowledgeable in compounding of various dosage forms. He is a trained and uh, he is supervised pharmacists, pharmacy technicians, assistants, and new pharmacy graduates. He is competent with Crawl Pharmacy Software and Microsoft Office. I welcome you, sir. Thank you so much. And uh, uh, with this, uh, you may please start sharing your screen and then we can proceed ahead, sir. So I'm stopping uh, my screen share and you may please share the screen, sir. And participants, uh, sir, will be walking us through various career opportunities at Canada. And uh, please make notes during this session. And uh, during the Q&A session, you may have the liberty to, you know, unmute yourself and then ask the questions. And uh, I also have collected some questions uh, just in case you don't want to ask anything. I'll take care of that as well. So I'll ask on your behalf. Sir, kindly share the PowerPoint. Right now, your uh, uh, browser screen is visible. Okay. Already. Is it visible now? Yeah, perfect, sir. Kindly make it full screen, sir. F5, yeah. Yeah. Perfect. Okay, so... Welcome everybody. Thank you so much, Manoj, for uh, your effort in uh, organizing this uh, talk. It's highly appreciated. My pleasure. I know that a lot of uh, lot of our um, uh, the new young graduates and also people who started their career in pharmacy uh, must be interested in knowing uh, the pharmacy practice in Canada in general and. Um, various other possible opportunities. Absolutely. Um, am I audible to everybody? Yes, sir, very much, sir. Okay. Participants, you may uh, use the chat box to, you know, uh, stay connected with, sir. Yeah, you're audible very much, sir. All right. Okay. So now, as you all know, the topic we chose, career opportunities for pharmacy professionals in Canada. So initially when we, when we agreed, I was um, quite not very comfortable when using this particular phrase here. I will tell you why later. Um, I, I, more, more of I wanted to talk about the profession of pharmacy in Canada and with more emphasis on um, community pharmacy, because that is the area majority of uh, pharmacists in Canada, um, they're employed and uh, interested in, and that's where they're most needed. So uh, I thought of uh, sharing that experience, but then uh, that's where the opportunities um, exist, right? So um, that's why then we had to change and we all agreed that we keep the, the uh, title as Career Opportunities for Pharmacy Professionals in Canada. So uh, thank you very much for uh, that wonderful uh, introduction of myself. Okay, awesome. um, so yeah, so I've been uh, in this uh, pharmacy profession with uh, various roles for about 19 years, but uh, I've been in Canada for uh, now about eight years now. I moved here in uh, 2010 and took almost two years for me to complete all the formalities of uh, licensing. So eight years in uh, in actual practice. 
So currently I am working for Walmart Canada Corporation and uh, I am in a province called Alberta in Canada. It is one of the Western province. And uh, the place where I am now is called Slave Lake, which is about 300 kilometers away from our capital city called Edmonton. I don't know how many of us heard about Edmonton. Uh, that's where I am. And uh, let's look into, we all talk about Canada, but uh, I'm pretty sure a lot of us don't know how vast is the country. Uh, we must have heard a few places like a Toronto or Ottawa or Vancouver and things like that. But um, it's big, it's huge. So this is the map of Canada. As you can see, it's been divided into about 10 different provinces and uh, three territories. So with a population of approximately about 40 million. Now there are about, out of 40 million, 21.9% of population constitutes immigrants. So you can imagine the Canada as a country is highly dependent on immigrants. So let's have a peek into the climate condition in Canada. So we have two extremes here. So the winter can be a bit harsh in Canada. So as you can see on the right hand of this uh, screen here, the same street, how it looks in summer and how it looks in winter. So the winter temperatures can vary somewhere from minus 15 to minus 40 degrees centigrade. So it typically starts from late October and it can extend up to end of April and even up to May. And then summer is usually beautiful here, about 18 degree to a minimum to up to 35 degree. And in fact, this year we had a wonderful summer. So that shows how the weather extremes can be in this country. So one should be ready for, you know, just to this kind of weather. So just a second here. It's a bit of system glitch. Yeah, it's, it's fine, sir. It looks good now, sir. Alrighty. So let's talk about the Canadian healthcare system. So mainly Canadian healthcare system is uh, divided into three different layers of care, we call it. We have primary care, we have secondary care, and we have tertiary care. As you can see here, the pharmacists are in the middle. And we are the bridging profession here. So we bridge all the different levels of care. So usually patients will visit their primary care physicians and if they need a higher level of care, then they refer to secondary care. And then there is a thin line between the secondary and tertiary care. But in practice, there is no much difference. But the difference is mainly here between primary care and a higher level. So, so primary care, mainly here you can see uh, the physicians, dentists, optometrists, and we have another uh, whole set of prescribers here. Uh, many of us may not know this, it's called nurse practitioners. So these are the practicing nurses, they get, uh, a higher education and they are given the permission to prescribe medications and assess the patients. So these professionals here in the primary care, if they need a higher level, if their patients need a higher level of uh, care, they refer them to uh, the secondary um, care specialists. They're mainly specialists like cardiologists, rheumatologists, endocrinologists, or even um, the dental surgeons, they all consider as secondary care. 
and then of course the people who are diagnosed with any uh, type of cancer they'll be referred to tertiary care so now when it comes to pharmacies as you can see here the patients and caregivers so either they can walk in directly into the pharmacy to get the help with their healthcare needs or they can directly go to primary care physicians but the most of times we have seen that patients usually come to pharmacist first they discuss with us and then we decide whether we can take care of the patient's healthcare needs within the scope of our practice or should we be referring them to the primary care physicians or primary care practitioners so and then of course pharmacists um, will usually you know communicate with other regulatory bodies and in constant touch with uh, the third parties we call it um, we have uh, insurance companies in canada which uh, pays for uh, most of the the medications and other um, the healthcare so as you can see here a vital role played by the pharmacists and they are right in the middle or at the center of circle of care we call it so now let's move on to community practice in canada so how does the practice works in canada raj is everything okay there yes sir it's perfect perfect okay just yes, making sir. sure that i'm audible yes sir right so now um in canada the pharmacists are taking an expanded role what does this mean is we are not only doing our traditional dispensing role meaning receiving a prescription from a physician or any prescriber and just giving the pills so our role doesn't end there so we assume additional responsibilities to make sure that whatever the medication has been dispensed or has been provided to that patient by the pharmacist and it gives the full or it serves the purpose for which it has been prescribed for so and also um we ensure that the medication uh, works for the intended uh, use and also there are no adverse reactions or any um drug drug or drug disease interactions so because of this expanded role the pharmacists are recognized as medication management experts of the healthcare team and pharmacists are most accessible healthcare professionals in canada because pharmacists are the only healthcare professionals wherein the pharm uh, the patients can directly walk in without an appointment without waiting they can walk in any time they can discuss with the pharmacist they can explain their uh, healthcare needs and then the pharmacist can make a decision whether they can uh, take care of the the patient within their scope of practice or uh, they need to refer for uh, further assessment so um this is the overall picture currently we have about 42650 pharmacists in the country and there are only about 10924 pharmacies across canada and this is an interesting finding here patients see their pharmacist about one and a half to 10 times more often than their primary care physicians so as you can see how much of opportunity a pharmacist has to develop that or build that relationship the professional relationship with the patients get to know their uh, the healthcare needs so this is where we differentiate ourselves from uh, the rest of the the professionals in our circle of care so now let's watch two videos here to understand it better stop sharing and okay share screen do this and whatever uh, tab
so i think that link is closed yeah it's here your program then so five years of university uh, difficult definitely um, heavy in the sciences heavy in the labs um, great faculty though small faculty get to know your teachers and the fellow students and that was the experience of university how are you Hi. after I graduated I worked for a chain um, for about a year and a half and at that point I realized I wanted more of a patient-centered focus or more of a clinical focus which is how I arrived here and I ended up being an owner, so did I know a lot about business? No. <laughs> uh, learned it along the way. Um, it's certainly a, a challenge, but it's, it's a whole different aspect. It's the business of pharmacy plus being a pharmacist um, and just being a business owner, everything from payroll to paying invoices and all that sort of thing, but just adds another fun dynamic, I guess. A typical day here would start with me coming in and just getting the pharmacy all ready to go for business, which would be getting the till ready, getting the computers ready, having a look at what happened from the day before and making sure loose ends are tied up. Once the day begins, we deal a lot with the patients as they come in. We never know what that will bring. Uh, so they're bringing us new prescriptions or needing refilled prescriptions for things we already have on file. Different working hours as a pharmacist, I think the whole spectrum exists. Here we work days and a half day on weekends, no holidays. Um, some of the chains would be evenings, weekends, holidays, hospitals, could be shift work. So I think you can run the full gamut. It, it could be as flexible as you need it to be. One of the important things that pharmacists do is identify potential drug-related problems or drug interactions. So knowing the medications well and how they interact with others um, is a very important part of what we do. 
See, your pulse is identical, but that yeah. top one starts... I think some people may be surprised to know that we're taking blood pressures and reporting those values on to their physicians. I think they may be surprised that we're doing vaccinations now. Um, some people are surprised that we do blister packaging. We do home visits for patients who perhaps can't get out or if we identify problems that we think might need to be um, evaluated and sometimes that's best to do in a home situation. The nice part about a home visit is it allows us to sit uh, in their home and in a comfortable environment with the patient and often we're um, able to get a lot more information from a patient in that scenario. Sometimes we're the first stop in the medical health system. So people will come in because they've established a relationship with us over the years. And whether it be they have a cold and they want something over the counter or um, they're having trouble breathing, they think it's due to a cold. But because we have some of the other information um, on their health profile, we may be able to identify things that alert us to the fact that you know this is not where we need to be taking care of them. We need to refer them on to their physician. So bridging the gap, but sometimes just referring them straight on in that, you know, this isn't where you need to be. You really need to get into either see your doctor or, or another healthcare professional. The work-life balance as a pharmacist has worked well for me. I get to do a, a great deal of spending time with my kids and chauffeuring them around, volunteering at the school. Um, it's just been a great balance. You can do a lot within the profession depending on where you want to be or what you want to focus on. You know, if you want to do private practice or if you'd like to work in collaboration with other healthcare professionals or work in a hospital setting, I think that, um, especially with our ex expanded scopes of practice that we've been granted, it, it just opens a lot, of, a lot of doors. And so the whole gamut is in, in front of pharmacists right now. Being a pharmacist I, I find to be very satisfying because it, it changes every day. The patients you deal with change every day. The problems you deal with change every day. The physicians you deal with change every day. So it, it's never the same thing. At times it's extremely hectic. Um, you have discharges from the hospital and some problem with a patient that you've had for years who's on home care. Um, it's just constantly changing. Um, it changes also within the you know new medications coming out, new therapies, new patients that you're gaining, new relationships that you're forming with your patients. So it's just constantly evolving. Pharmacy has been a wonderful career choice. Um, I still love getting up to go to work, and I love what I do. Um, I enjoy the challenges of day-to-day -day practice, and 16 years later, I'm still smiling. To become a pharmacist, you will typically require five or more years of post-secondary studies. If working as a pharmacist interests you, there's more information available, including salary. Alrighty. So those are the two videos I wanted to share with you all. You need to stop sharing. Manoj, can you see the PowerPoint now? Wait, no, wait. not yet, sir. You have to restart the sharing one more time. Okay. And now click the power green. Or this. It's okay, though. You need to go to the... Uh, okay. All good so far? Yeah, all good, sir. Thank you. All righty. So now, let's, let's look into in brief about what is an expanding role we are talking about. What is the scope of practice? So the scope of practice can really vary amongst the provinces in Canada. It's not that all the provinces are the same. Some provinces have a little bit of more expanded role than the others. But in general, these are some of the, the expanded roles um, the pharmacists are practicing now, initiating medication therapy. So initiating medication therapy can be um, for a minor ailment, but in provinces like Alberta, where I am working now, um, we can be a fully prescribing pharmacist wherein there is no limit as to which medication you can initiate or prescribe, except for narcotics, of course, no narcotics control medications or targeted substances you can prescribe, but all the prescription medications you can However, you should know what you're doing, meaning there are some set of standards set by the college. You have to meet that. 
and you need to be competent and competent about the, the therapy we are doing. And then of course you have to collaborate with uh, their primary care physicians. So then um, pharmacists are authorized to administer injections. So injections include vaccinations or any other medications. So when it comes to vaccinations, as we all know, we are still in the pandemic and pharmacists have played a significant role in rolling out the vaccinations. So pharmacists contributed more than 50% of vaccinations in this country. So you can see how much uh, the pharmacists can do in terms of uh, the, the public health. So then managing patient medications. So this is another area wherein pharmacists play a significant role, making sure that whatever the patient's medications they're currently taking, they're working to their fullest potential and they're safe. And then identify if there is any uh, therapy gap and then address it accordingly. And then managing chronic disease. So this is another significant role wherein pharmacists can save a huge lot of burden to public health by managing the chronic disease, such as diabetes, hypertension, or cardiovascular conditions, wherein a patients can be on multiple different medications. And then it is our job or our professional responsibility to make sure that all the medications are working and their conditions are well controlled. And then pharmacists are also in the forefront helping the patients who are addicted to tobacco or any other uh, the form of uh, uh, the tobacco or any other addiction uh, in quitting smoking and the things like that. And then the lifestyle advice. So especially we come across a lot of people who have a lot of risk factors to get the chronic conditions. So we look into it and see if a person has any family history of any chronic conditions or if their um, lifestyle is in, in danger, which can potentially um, cause or may lead to a chronic condition in future. We alert them in time and then give them advice as to how they can uh, start taking care of themselves from now in order to to prevent that occurrence in future. So um, I found one good article called Community Pharmacists Evolving Role in Canadian Primary Healthcare, a vision of harmonization and a patchwork in a patchwork system. So this can be accessed in this link. So this is a very good article, which kind of looks into uh, what is the Canadian healthcare system and where actually pharmacists have um, involved in integrating themselves into the healthcare system and how they evolved over a period of time in expanding their roles and how they are assuming a wide responsibility um, in taking care of uh, the patient's health. So this is a snapshot of uh, the various uh, Canadian provinces and what are the various, uh, the expanded role have been uh, implemented already. As you can see, uh, some provinces are far, far ahead and other provinces are still lagging behind. And as you can see, the province of Alberta is in the forefront. So, which has a green check mark on all the various expanded scope of practice. So Alberta is the only province in Canada which has approved uh, independent prescription of a Schedule One drug. So Schedule One drug means these are the prescription only medications. So a pharmacist should be able to prescribe this. And then in other provinces, they have a uh, different. Uh, types of uh, the prescriptive authority, such as collaborative practice with uh, other healthcare professionals and also for minor ailments and things like that. 
So pharmacists are also allowed to adopt or managing the ongoing medications. Let's say if a patient has um, a chronic condition and he has been prescribed some medications and his condition is stable, but his prescription refills have really, uh, run out and he's not able to see the doctor in time. And then you as a pharmacist, you can make an assessment. And if you are convinced that the person's uh, condition is stable and the medication is working well, uh, there are no drug related problem. And then of course, patient need that medication for the continuity of care. Definitely you can go ahead and renew that medication even up to six months. And that's how long you can, as a pharmacist, can continue the therapy. But of course, you have to communicate with, the, with their physician and let them know that you have renewed the medication. And then in, let's say if there are any issues with the medication, uh, if you need to change the dosage of the medication, if you need to change the direction of the medication, or if you have to substitute that medication with another medication, which which is therapeutically equivalent. That's where uh, we call it as adoption of the prescription, meaning you are modifying a, an existing prescription for the patient's current need. So you have that authority as well. As long as you are convinced and you have all the evidence to show that a change in the prescription is needed uh, for the ongoing management of patient therapy, you can go ahead and do that change, but of course, uh, take the consent of the patient, discuss with the patient, and then inform their prescriber. That is what we call it as adopting a prescription. And then there are situations wherein there will be some emergencies. Let's say if we come across a patient who is visiting from another province or another city, and if he has forgot his medication back home, and he might come and say that, hey, look, I'm on so-and-so medication and I left it at home and I'm here, I cannot go back, but I can't, I can't be without that medication. So you can collect that information from the patient and all the other different sources, and then you can continue that medication for a week or two weeks, uh, whatever is needed for that patient. So that is what we call it as prescribing in an emergency situation. So these are some of the expanded scope of practice. We will, we will discuss some more of this in uh, later slides. So let's talk something about now um, the international pharmacy graduates. That's why we're all here now. So where do, the, where do the IPGs or international pharmacy graduates fit in? How, how they can come and practice in Canada? Are there any opportunities? Are there any challenges? So now look into the opportunities. So as we discussed earlier, and we have also seen in that video, bulk of the pharmacists, the licensed pharmacists in Canada, they are employed in the community pharmacy. Up to 70% of them are all working in community pharmacy. And only about 15% of them are working in the hospitals and the remaining 15% are in various other areas, such as industries, research, regulatory bodies, and insurance companies, and things like that. When it comes to Canadian graduates, they're almost job ready. This is because they have been trained in such a way from their first year of pharmacy education, they have been exposed to the pharmacies they will do their clinical rotations or internship from their first year itself. And even some universities went one step ahead and it's a requirement for them uh, to get an admission that they should have prior experience in a pharmacy, working as an assistant or whatever the role, they need to have some exposure to the pharmacy to show that they are indeed interested in pharmacy. So as you can assume, as you can imagine here, uh, when they do graduate, they are almost job ready. They know what goes into a community pharmacy or in the hospital pharmacy, what is the requirement and how to manage. But when it comes to IPGs, we have been trained differently. 
So we need more training and more exposure. And that is a whole lot of uh, different planning is needed. So now, um, where are the pharmacies needed the most? So most of the rural cities, the bigger, uh, the bigger cities, they're fully saturated with pharmacies. And it's so hard to find a job because we don't have many bigger cities and a few bigger cities, uh, the most of the population are living there. And uh, as you can imagine, um, most of the pharmacists also, they want to stay in the bigger cities. So it's very hard to find a job in uh, bigger cities. Smaller towns, of course, there are requirements for pharmacists. So one has to be ready uh, to move to smaller towns and uh, um, embrace all the challenges. So now community versus hospital pharmacy. So for hospital pharmacy, um, a separate set of training is required. It's highly competitive. Um, there are not many hospitals are there. And even there are a few hospitals, the number of positions are less. Um, so it is a bit challenging to find a job in the hospital. So now what are the challenges for international pharmacy graduates? So of course it's a new country. So there are a lot of processes are involved. Now, the first and foremost important uh, challenge here for an IPG is immigration to Canada. So there is a qualification process. So you have to see what is the way, how I can immigrate to Canada because unless if uh, you are immigrated here, it's, it's highly difficult to find a job. So nowadays, a lot has changed. Um, most of, the, most of the, the employers, they look for a permanent residency status or a citizenship. There are hardly anybody who will be ready to sponsor a work permit. So um, you have to find a way of how you can immigrate to Canada first. So that is the first challenge. Then once you do qualify, let's say you, 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 you have been approved for uh, a PR or even um, if you manage to get a work permit, then moving to Canada. So that's also not easy job. It takes a lot of planning there. Then once you move to Canada, then you have to start integration, integrating into the country. Um, you need to get used to the weather system the language, the cultural barriers, because the language, though many people um, know English, which is um, just not enough. So you need to know how to understand the people, um, their day-to-day -day slangs, um, the way they behave. So a lot need to be adjusted with and need to be learned. So then next biggest challenge here is licensing process. So this is a marathon race. And there is uh, the initial hurdle of qualification. You have to get qualified even to take up the examinations. And then there are a series of exams you need to challenge. And then you have to do internship. So these are the basic requirements for uh, licensing process, which we are going to talk about it a little bit detail in uh, later slides. Then there's a financial challenge. A bit of, quite a bit of money is involved here. So the money can go into the application process because the lot of fees you have to pay for qualification, the examination and the things like that, your immigration process, there's a lot of processes and applications involved. Then, yeah, examination phase. And then the bridging program. So more and more provinces here in Canada are making the bridging programs a mandatory. So which again, we will discuss a little bit further uh, in later slides. Then you need the, the financial or money for your visa, your study or work permit, the travel, and you have to leave and sustain until you find the job. So a bit of financial planning is needed. 
So after all these challenges, what are the rewards? Of course, you will have job satisfaction. You get to apply your knowledge into practice and you will get professional recognition and a better quality of life, no doubt about it. So now, how to become a pharmacist in Canada? What are the requirements for an international pharmacy graduate? So a lot has changed since I um, got licensed and now it's been about 10 years. So this first thing was not existing then, but now they make it mandatory that you are to enroll into Pharmacist Gateway Canada. So I have provided the link there. So they have a step-by-step -step guide as to uh, how to proceed with the licensing. So this is the, the beginning. You are to enroll in, uh, into Pharmacist Gateway of Canada. So this is, um, this is under NAPRA. So NAPRA is nothing but National Association of uh, Pharmacy Regulatory Authorities in Canada. So they develop or they design um, all the steps or the requirements to become a pharmacist in Canada. So once you enroll into Pharmacist Gateway of Canada, then you have to apply for PEBC examinations. So PEBC stands for the Pharmacy Examining Board of Canada. So this board administers the basic exams and they issue a certificate to say that, yes, this particular candidate has proven that his education and his knowledge of pharmacy is equivalent to a Canadian graduate. So, these are the various steps. You have to apply for a document evaluation, wherein they go through your educational credentials, um, your uh, the subjects what you have studied, and then they will tally and see if that meets the Canadian requirement. So once the document evaluation has been done and approved, um, you will be allowed to take up this initial examination called evaluating exam. So now this examination, um, when I took this exam, I had only one option of coming to Canada and write the exam. But now they have expanded to all the other parts of the world, including India, even places like Bangalore, you can take the exam. So this is a plus point. So once you're once you have passed the evaluating exam, then you can take up the next level of exam called qualifying examination, which consists of two parts. One is a written exam, which is nowadays computer-based. It's called multiple choice questions. And the second part is called ASCII, which is nothing but objective structured clinical examination. So this qualifying examination is the same exam what the Canadian and US graduates face. So there is no difference. So once, you're, once you have passed the evaluating exam, that means you are as equivalent as a Canadian or a US graduate. So then you're all on the same board to challenge the qualifying examination. Now, the only difference is um, Canadian graduates, of course, they have been trained uh, to face this examination, but unfortunately, IPGs are not. So we need more training and um, um, extra practice. So then once the PBC exam is done, then you will have to apply for provincial regulatory uh, body for um, the license, all the licenses are issued by the provincial regulatory authorities. So you had to choose which province you want to practice and that particular province's regulatory body you had to apply. And in order to do that, you would have, have to pass the PEBC exam and then you should provide the proof of language proficiency. There is a list of different language tests you can take which is again there in Pharmacist Gateway of Canada. You can find more information there. 
So once you meet that requirement, then provincial regulatory body will go through your credentials and then you will have to take another examination called uh, a jurisprudence examination. So with the name itself indicates all the, the regulations and requirements for running a pharmacy and uh, ethical requirements and things like that. Um, that's what they test in that examination. And then you are ready for license. So now this is an interesting thing here. So currently there are four provinces, they made the bridging programs mandatory. So now what is a bridging program? So these are the programs designed for international pharmacy graduates because they know that international pharmacy graduates lack few competencies. And then they also know that our practice is entirely different back home than here. So what they've done, some of the universities came together and they designed a short program wherein they take the IPGs through various scenarios and they give plenty of uh, the practice, on-hand practices as to how to interact with the patients and they have simulations, lab simulations and patient air scenario simulations, wherein they give plenty of practices for you to go and practice. So by the time a person finishes this exam, his confidence level increases in terms of both practices as well as the facing the exams. So I highly recommend this, but as I said, there are four provinces, Alberta, British Columbia, Ontario, and Quebec. So without taking the bridging program, you can't even apply for license in those provinces. But the other provinces currently, they do not require this, but they will all follow soon. So, and they're a bit expensive as well. So on an average, it might cost up to 13,000 Canadian dollars. So then this is the last step of becoming a licensed pharmacist, that is internship, and again, the length of the internship varies from one province to another province. It can vary from somewhere from around 500 to 600 hours in um, provinces like the British Columbia, 2,600 hours in uh, places like Ontario. So now what next? Once you get licensed, where are the opportunities? How to find a job? So you can find a job only after licensing. If you're not licensed, you cannot apply as a pharmacist. Um, I'm talking about only in community and hospital. And of course, you need to have, have either a work permit or a permanent residence. So, and again, bigger cities, next to impossible to find a job. Smaller towns and rural communities still need promises. And most of the jobs are not advertised. It's all kind of word of mouth. So it's very important that you should start building network. You need to know the people. And some of the larger companies, they post their positions on their own website. To give some examples, we have Walmart, where I work now. There's Shoppers Drug Mart, which is the biggest chain of uh, uh, drug stores in Canada. And then there's uh, Rexall, which is next to Apple's Drug Mart. And then there are some job search sites, um, such as Indeed, I'm sure um, many of us are well familiar with this. So they will have most of the postings from various pharmacies. And there are some hiring agencies, but there are very few, such as RPI Consulting Group. And these agencies are useful to find some relief ships, meaning once a person got graduated, I mean, uh, licensed, and uh, it might take some time to find a, a permanent position. So until then, you can find some small relief ships here and there. So these kind of groups or uh, the agencies will help you find few um, relief positions or relief ships. 
and you can even open your own pharmacy. However, there's a stiff competition. So things have changed. So you, have, you should be ready uh, to face the, the competition from big box stores. And then there are other hurdles. Every now and then there will be provincial budget cuts and reduction in generic drug prices. So leading to reduced profit. This may take up to three to five years to see a decent profit once you open a pharmacy. And then of course, it needs experience, financial capabilities. Well, there are options. You can avail loans from banks and financial institutions. So but... your voice is lagging. Is it better now? Yeah, it's better now, yeah. Oh, probably I was moving away from the screen. Sorry. Oh, that's that's fine, sir. That's fine. Already. Okay, yeah, you can you can stop any time. Not a problem, sir. Sir, little bit, you, uh, if you can just put the screen a little, uh, you know, far, uh, because your face is not visible, clearly. Where is now? Yeah, it's okay. It's fine. Yeah, the screen is so full, I can't see my face here. <laughs> <laughs> Already, I just, uh, just listed some of the, the provincially funded pharmacy services in the province of Alberta, just to give you an idea uh, where are the additional revenues comes to the pharmacy? So, and these are what we uh, we were discussing about uh, the expanded scope of pharmacist practice. So I'm not gonna dig deep into it, but I will give you a brief about what it means. So it's something called a comprehensive annual care plan. So, what, what does this mean is, let's say if you come across a patient, for example, a patient with a diabetes and he has other chronic conditions or comorbidities, um, such as a hypertension or the person may be obese or the person may be also smoking. So now you see there is a, a multiple problem. Um, there is at least more than one medical condition or there's more than, I mean, there is one medical condition and a risk factor such as obesity or uh, drug addiction or um, the tobacco use. So, and then there are, of course, the multiple medication. So you, you talk to the patient and you see there is a gap. Um, his condition is not managed well, meaning, um, his targets are not met, his sugars are not met, the sugars are not on, on target, his blood pressure is not on target, his cholesterol levels are not on target. So you sit with the patient, discuss with them, find out where the problem is. Is it the, uh, the drug problem? Is it patient understanding of the medication? So that's what we call it as a drug therapy problem or identifying the drug therapy problem. So once you identify a drug therapy problem, you come up with a care plan. So there is a specific format. Um, so that format in general, what it says is that, okay, this is the patient, this is his history, and these are the current situation, and this is the drug therapy problem. So this is how we are going to address, and this is how we are going to follow up. So that is what a typical care plan means. So once you do that care plan and then you follow up, so that is what is called follow up. So each of these you can build to provincial plan. So for a, a care plan, they pay a higher dollar amount. And in places like Alberta, they pay up to $100 per care plan. And then for each follow up, they pay about $20. So, and you are allowed to do, uh, or you are allowed to build 12 care plan, I mean, 12 follow ups per year, per calendar year. So, similar to annual care plan, there's something called a standard medication management review. So, only difference between annual care plan and um, SMME is that SMME looks into how many medication a person is. A person should be on minimum three or four different medications. Then he is eligible for that. And then again, the step is same. 
you go through each medication and look into the condition why that medication has been prescribed for and see if it is working for that person if that patient has any concern or if the patient has any um, difficulty in remembering to take the medication and how best we can address it or if he is an asthmatic patient or a patient with a respiratory condition, look into all the, uh, the inhalers and see if that person well understood how to take that inhaler or re review with them. And then um, you come up with another care plan. So they don't pay as that much of uh, an annual care plan. They pay about $60 for this and then about $20 for the follow-up. And again, they allow up to 12 follow-ups per year. Then let's say if you come across a patient with a diabetic only, and then he will not fit into uh, standard medication management review because he's only on one medication. Then what they say is, okay, so you do one medication management review for diabetic itself, even though that person is not on more than one medication. Let's say he's only on metformin. We are allowed to do one care plan for or one standard medication management review for that person. And again, you can bill sixty dollars for that. Similarly, if you come across a person who is a smoker and if he want to or if he decided by himself to quit smoking, or upon your consultation with him and you came to know that he's smoking and then you had a chat with him and he agreed to quit smoking, then you go and help him, whatever the ways, um, help him or um, recommend him or prescribe him a nicotine replacement therapy. Or if you have the prescribing authorization, give him a, a Champix or a Verenicline or a Bipropion, whatever, uh, will help in uh, curbing that withdrawal symptoms. And then you come up with a care plan for him. So that's what we call it as a tobacco cessation specific care plan. And again, you can claim $60 for that. And then we talked about prescription adaptation. You make any changes to a prescription you received from your doctor. Um, you can claim up to $20 for that change what you make because you are spending time with the patient and then comes administration of injections. So as I already mentioned, we took a huge role in administering COVID vaccines this year. In my own pharmacy, I have administered more than 2000 uh, COVID shots um, since the, the beginning of April up until now. Of course, the interest has gone down a bit. Majority of the people got immunized, but still people are coming for it. Um, so it's not only immunization, um, any, any other injectable drug, as long as you have all the requirements uh, by the college. So that can be your, um, the hormonal injections, that can be any other immunizations such as flu or influenza immunization or uh, the pneumococcal immunization for people 65 and old, or it can be uh, shingles um, immunization for herpes jaster. So it can be any injections you can. Then prescription renewal. So if, you, if you're confident that you can uh, carry on or advance the prescription for a, a patient's ongoing medication, so that also paid for. So, and prescription renewal and prescription emergency supply they are very, very close. So renewal meaning you should know the person very well and you should know the medical, medical condition very well and you should have developed that therapeutic relationship with the patient very well, then you can renew the prescription. But the emergency supply can be for anybody who come to your pharmacy and say that, no, I, I lost my inhaler or my uh, insulin got spoiled. Um, can you give me an emergency supply until I go and see my doctor or my uh, regular pharmacy? So that is what is called as um, an emergency supply of medication. So this is a huge thing, as I already discussed in the previous slides, describing at initial access, and it's only, um, 
only happens currently in the province of Alberta and only APA pharmacists can do it. A person, a, a pharmacist should have additional prescribing authorization and it is a process. You have to convince your college or regulatory authority that you are confident and you have uh, enough knowledge about the medication and you can initiate the medication and you, you can collaborate with the, with the prescribers and you can manage uh, patient medication. And then you are free to, uh, to go ahead and uh, do that prescription for the people. Then there are other um, few expanded scope of practice. You can also refuse to fill a prescription. If uh, a patient brings a prescription and if you're not satisfied that that prescription um, will help the patient or if the prescription is going to cause any problem, you can refuse to fill that and um, you, can, you can claim a fee for your time. And then there are trial prescription. Trial prescription means if you get a prescription, let's say a new medication for a patient and the prescription is for three months. And if you're in doubt that the medication may not work well, or um, if there is a, a potential for any adverse drug reaction, you can give a very smaller quantity uh, that is called a trial prescription. And then this 14 and 15, they were introduced only during the pandemic. So you can make an assessment to screen or for the test of uh, COVID-19. So you can uh, claim a fee for that. Um, and also, if you make an assessment of a patient who want to test for COVID, even for that also you can uh, claim a fee. So these two fees they've in included in during the pandemic. So um, now let's talk about some of the practical tips. Um, these are some of the points I have uh, kind of tried to summarize here and wanted to share with you all. Um, this is for those who are seriously thinking of coming to Canada, what, what you should really uh, looking into and how best you can prepare yourself. So these are all, um, some of them, most of them are all my personal experience, what I have undergone and what I'm seeing now, right? Now, deciding to come into Canada is a huge commitment, both financially and time. You have to invest a lot of money, you have to invest a lot of time. It may take up to three to five years and approximately about $50,000 to get licensed and finish the immigration process. This is an approximation. I'm not going to break down how much it will cost for what process, but giving you an overall idea. And then you need to be very flexible. Be ready to work in rural and remote communities. That's because only the rural communities have more opportunities. There's less competition, more jobs, job satisfaction because you will get to know, know people more and more because it will be a smaller town. You will see them on a daily basis. You develop that, that close relationship. Once you have that close relationship, it makes your job much more easier because they are more and more open to you. They will give you more, much more information than they give to their own doctors. So that makes your life easier to take that therapeutic decision. And then you'll get to work in a smaller team, uh, less stress, and you'll get full hours. If you go to the cities, you can't find full hours because so, much, so many people are available. Um, they may not give you full hours. And um, good pay. And, in rural communities, pay is much, much better than uh, the bigger cities. And expenses are less, and there are some tax benefits as well. So let's continue. Now, if somebody is seriously looking into moving to Canada, and if you want to work in a community pharmacy setting, I would highly recommend do as much of groundwork in India as possible. So gather 
as much of information on Canadian geography, weather conditions, things like that. Then get to know what are the immigration requirements because they keep changing. On a yearly basis, immigration rules and regulations are changing. So you need to keep an updated of all the latest developments. And then English language test. So you need to be ready for that. Now, as I said, a big bonus, evaluating examination can be taken in India. There are so many um, bigger cities, they have centers. So at least about 40% of the work you can do in India itself before uh, you move to Canada. And test your knowledge of pharmacy. Do as many case studies as possible. There are so many case studies available online. You can do that. Um, these, are, these are some of the references I would highly recommend you subscribe to either electronic format or um, order a hard copy of uh, CPS. CPS stands for Compendium of Pharmaceuticals and Specialities. This lists all the, all the products available, the pharmaceutical products available in Canada. And then there's something called therapeutic choices. So this is, I would say, a Bible of pharmacy until you pass the exam. Because most of the questions, um, especially the multiple choice questions, they are based on this book. You need to know in and out of this book. And of course, the size of this book is expanding on a yearly basis. Now it has become really big. And then there's another useful book called Patient Assessment for Minor Ailments. So these two books are really, really important if you're preparing for Canadian exam. Um, I would highly recommend even consider working in a pharmacy there in India itself. Try to, try to develop that interaction with the patients get used to how to handle the prescription, have that interaction and try to link and see why this person came to a pharmacy, what made him to go to doctors, what are the medications are in the prescription. So analyze the prescription and see what you can gather from there and work out from there. See if there is any drug therapy problem. See if there is anything lacking or anything missing which you can fulfill. There's another piece of suggestion from my side. Try to connect with people who are already preparing for the examination and they're in Canada. They can be of very valuable piece of information for you. And then bridging programs. So the bridging programs, as I said, more and more provinces are making it mandatory and it is highly recommended, but of course they're a bit expensive. And then if, if some of you can afford, try to join a pharmacy technician or pharmacy assistant program. So this will help to find a job in a pharmacy. So if that happens, that give you some exposure to pharmacy while you're preparing for this exam. And also you can use it as a tool to get your work permit. So you'll be allowed to work here. So that is something um, if somebody can afford to consider. And then many provinces, winter can last up to six months and winter conditions are a bit ha harsh here. As I said, uh, the temperature sometimes can go up to minus 40 and um, you should be ready to get used to that weather. Alrighty. That's all from my side. Any questions? Thank you so much for that wonderful presentation, sir. It was complete overview of the entire journey a in pharmacist can expect in Canada. I'm sure you know it was highly beneficial for all our attendees. So participants, not now it's time to you know get connected to sir and ask your specific question related to this session. Please restrict your session uh, question only with respect to today's session and don't ask any other uh, topics later. I'm sure you'll have a lot of doubts and clarifications uh, to ask. 
So just in case you want to unmute yourself and ask, uh, I'll give you the unmuting right. Just go on and raise your hand first uh, so that I can unmute you and then you can ask the question. Before uh, asking the question, introduce yourself from where you are, which part of the country, and then uh, go on. Sir, you can uh, stop sharing the screen if you want. Yeah. Yeah, perfect. And uh, maybe, yeah, now it looks great. Okay. So... Yeah, because I was not even able to see my face. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Okay. So now, uh, Zamir Ahmed, uh, you want to ask a question? I have given you the unmuting right. Go on, ask the question. Yeah. Hi, sir. Uh, good morning to all. And uh, uh, thank you, sir, for sharing so much of uh, great information. It was really helpful. And I also uh, thank Manoj, sir, for uh, hosting this session. You are doing a great job, sir. So uh, I am a pharmacist from Oman. I'm now I'm currently practicing pharmacist. So I want to ask few questions related to this uh, session. Sir, uh, Nitesh, sir, what is the gap between EE and MCQ? What is the maximum gap can we have for EE and MCQ exam? Well, as such, there is no gap. It's up to you how prepared you are. If you are, if you are confident that after the, the evaluating exam, if your papers are all approved and if you if you have the approval from uh, the PBC board uh, to take the uh, qualifying examination you can go ahead and do it i don't think there is any wait period it's all up to you how prepared you are but one one piece of advice here um do not underestimate these exams they are oh. brutal they are uh, i would say the Canadian pharmacy exam is the toughest exam anywhere you will find. So give yourself time, make sure that you are confident and check with others. Let them take, take their opinion. And then once they say that, yes, according to me, you are ready to take the examination, then yeah, go ahead and do it. Uh, sir, uh, just a clarification, because uh, the EE exam, we need to give it uh, uh, within five years of our document evaluation. So that was my uh, like query, like we have any time limit that uh, after within three years or two years of uh, qualifying the EE examination, we should give the qualifying examination? Um, yes, that is something I need to clarify because I did not, uh, when I was preparing this, uh, this presentation, I did not go detail into the processes because what you need to do is um, the, the, best, the best and single most source for you is PEBC board. Okay? And I have shared the link. Um, they have given all the step-by-step -step information there, including the timeline. There is a specific a heading called timelines, but you are right. So once your documents evaluation is approved, you have five years to take the evaluating exam. But after the evaluating exam, my understanding is within five years, you should have given an attempt to your qualifying examination. But between the qualifying examination, let's say if you take MCQ now, within three years, you should have completed or passed your OSCE. Okay, sir. Sir, one more thing regarding the bridging program. You said that uh, Alberta and Ontario provinces are uh, making it mandatory to have the bridging exam. So uh, as per my uh, data, so what I have browsed in the PEBC, so it is only after you uh, give the first attempt and you fail in the first attempt, you are processed for the bridging exam. Uh, is my understanding correct? Okay, let me make this uh, clear here. PEBC has got nothing to do with the bridging programs. PEBC mandate is only to evaluate the candidates, okay, and certify that a person, a pharmacist is qualified as a pharmacist. But then it is up to the regulatory body, the provincial regulatory body, to accept that qualification and other additional requirement. That's where the bridging program comes. Bridging program is a requirement of provincial regulatory body, not PEBC. PEBC has got nothing to do with the bridging program. Okay, sir. Okay. Thank you so much, sir.
thank you so much for your time and also thanks manoj sir for uh, allowing me to ask these questions sure good luck thank you zamir and thank you nitesh sir for answering that question so anybody else wants to ask any question please raise your hand and then uh, we'll unmute you and it's already 11:45 in the night for nitesh sir on friday night mm-hmm. i'm okay i mean if somebody has question they You're can okay? oh can great thank oh, yeah, you so I'm much okay. sir so kind of oh, yeah. so uh, participants please if you want to interact with sir or ask any specific question go on okay so christy uh, i am unmuting you please go on um hi sir good morning um so i'm christy and i'm from bangalore so i have a question to ask that is um, during your last slides you told that taking up a course like pharmacy technician or a pharmacy assistant uh, yeah. uh, would be uh, beneficial for us to come over there and you know uh, practice also before we um, at- attempt the exam a yeah, qualifying sure. exam um, mm-hmm. so what is the main difference between a pharmacy technician and an assistant and uh, which would be better like uh, i'm right. a pharmacy graduate and when i'm trying to uh, attempt a farm like you know a pharmacy qualifying exam which one would mm-hmm. uh, mm-hmm. benefit me more uh, like working as a pharmacy assistant or as a technician okay yeah wonderful question yeah. so now technicians uh, i'm not sure if you have paid attention to that first video i played so now technicians are a regulated profession here in about um, uh, i think about 5 5 or 6 years ago a lot of provinces they decided to go on this and now technicians are a regulated pro- profession um they they take up some uh, additional uh, coursework and they challenge uh, a pbs exam like how we all face the pbs exam they also challenge a pbs exam and then they have given the title technician a technician means is a regulated profession but an assistant is an unregulated meaning you can hire a person and train them um as an assistant uh, but technicians they carry liabilities and they can take the ownership of a prescription meaning um if if there if the pharmacy receives a prescription and if the pharmacist has seen the prescription a technician can finalize it and approve the prescription and sign off on that prescription so that is the basic difference between uh, uh, a pharmacy technician and a pharmacy assistant Did, did I answer your question, Christy? I think she mute muted. Yeah, Christy, you are uh, okay. Uh, yes, sir. Right now, yeah, I can. Yeah, did now. I answer your question, Christy? Um, yes, sir. Yes, you did. Yeah, thank you, sir. Yeah, well, thank you, Christy. Thank you, Nitesh, sir. So, next question is from Rosella. Rosella, you can please unmute yourself. and ask the question yes sir hello yeah. sir i'm rosella and i'm a recent pharmd graduate so okay. i plan on answering my uh, pvc exams in the coming years so uh, while going to the pvc site i noticed that the evaluating exam has 125 questions but it is scored out of 200 so do you uh, can you please exp- do, do you have any idea on how the questions are scored like on what basis uh oh, well, uh i did not quite get it so you said that there are 200 questions and out of 200 you had answer 150 sorry sir no sir uh like uh, there is a sample question paper for the evaluating exam on the pbc site and right. that sample question paper has 125 questions but then oh, okay. it says that your we are scored based on a total of 200 yes so there will be 200 questions in the actual okay. exam there will be 200 questions and in the evaluating exam um they will they will calculate the the marks score by score but then they will not give you the actual score they will just let you know whether you passed or failed okay um but um, yeah that is a, that is a straight uh, straight forward scoring system but uh, the mcq your next level is a little bit complicated 
that okay. that depends on the on the difficulty level and uh, depends on how many people and how many difficult questions they answer based on that they will use uh, a statistical uh, method to do the uh, the scoring okay so basically there are 200 questions and it is scored out of 200 um the number of question wise i'm not very sure i need to verify with the pcc board but i know that there are roughly about 150 to 200 questions and then uh, now it is uh, computer based earlier it used to be a paper based when i gave the exam it was paper based um the difficulty level increases as, as you start answering the questions it is going to get more and more difficult and then as so as the questions get more and more difficult your score also goes higher Okay. um i think that's what they call it as a computer adaptive uh testing but as i said i don't have the full details of the exams as such because i did not look too much details into it um but yeah this is how in general it works okay all right thank you so well thank you rosella and thank you nitesh sir for answering that okay next question anybody else wants to ask a question please raise your hand so that i can uh, you know identify you and allow you to unmute yourself because unless you raise your hand i won't be able to identify you here okay so there is a question from anil sir in the chat box he says uh, people ask is indian pharmd degree valid in canada for pharmacist job sir uh, nitesh sir you are on mute sorry about that okay um well, it doesn't matter whether it's a pharmd or basic degree but they are asking for a four degree of uh, basic pharmacy education it doesn't matter pharmd or regular b pharm okay for now at least but uh, uh, remember in canada all the universities have already shifted to farm d now there is there's no more uh, bs pharmacy here <clears throat> it's been changed almost 3 uh, to 4 years ago i, I believe okay. they they might change that soon but as of now it's four year uh, uh, basic bs pharmacy or b pharm what it call so next uh, thank you sir for that uh, neha you can uh, ask unmute yourself and ask the question uh, hello sir uh, this is Hi. neha uh, Hi, i'm neha. currently pursuing my m farm uh, in india mm -hmm. and i'm looking forward to higher studies in canada um, okay. maybe a phd also so mm -hmm. when i'm pursuing uh, a phd uh during that time uh, we will be having to do these part time jobs so okay uh, uh, what is the requirement for me to be eligible to work as a assistant or something like in a pharmacy okay so now in general when you when you are accepted as a student in any canadian university mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. along with the study permit they do issue a work permit but that work permit will have a limitation so you they will indicate how many hours maximum you can work but all the students are allowed to take take a part part time jobs either uh, within the campus or off the campus uh, okay sir sir uh, is pbc mandatory if you are planning to work in industry well uh, first of all there are not many industries and then pbc has got nothing to do with the industry and then as i said pbc is just a exam exam administering body only um it is it is up to the what you call um, um if you are if you are planning to work as a pharmacist it's up to the provincial regulatory authorities um but as far as the industry is concerned uh, the licensing is not needed so there is no question of pbc there so that is just like if there is any opportunity you have to just find it and uh, approach the employer directly because it's not a um it's not a regulated i mean to say you need not get a, a pharmacist license for that 
Uh, sir, then there are uh, certain uh, Canadian websites which offer training, like Farm Achieve or something, which I've uh -huh. come across. Like, how beneficial are they? See, now, though Farm Achieve and all that, they are, um, uh, they will they will give you some, uh, the practice sessions to face the exam, mainly for your ASCII. Um, the, the final level of PEBC exam, the objective structured clinical examination, that is a kind of practical examination. For that, they will prepare you for, to face that exam. That will be for uh, only a day or two uh, session. That is when you're ready to take the, or challenge the ASCII exam. Okay, sir. Okay. Thank you so much. Yeah. You're welcome. Okay. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you, Neha, and thank you, Nideshar, for that. You're welcome. Uh, Zamir, you want to ask one more question? Okay, I'm just giving you the unmuting option. Go on. Uh, hi, sir. Hi again. Uh, hi. Sir, uh, this question is a bit uh, different from today's related topic, but I just want to, because you are there now, so I just want you to yeah. ask. Sir, yeah. uh, uh, now I have completed my document evaluation for uh, uh, with the PEBC. So okay. uh, will, will it be considered uh, for a PNP if uh, the occupation is in demand or we need to complete the complete registration and uh, be a registered pharmacist to get our profile picked for the immigration? Well, PNP, the provincial nomination program, that is when um, um, in a particular in a particular province, you should uh, start working there. Uh, you should get licensed <coughs> and start working and you have to show them um, certain hours or um, the taking of the programs like a bridging program. So those are all, uh, uh, they all qualify you for a PNP program. I don't know much about, I don't know the details, but uh, when, I, when I took, uh, uh, the bridging program in uh, EC, British Columbia, that was in the University of uh, British Columbia. But that time it was not mandatory. Uh, but then I just took it because uh, I wanted that one because I had a big uh, gap in the pharmacy practice. So just to learn. So that time they said that, yeah, so uh, the, the basic purpose of uh, them designing that program is ultimately uh, preparing the candidates um, not only to for the license and also to get the PNP, um, I mean, get into PNP nomination. So my understanding is um, after after evaluating exam, um, you should uh, start pursuing the other stages of exam. Um, and then either you have to join a bridging program or um, I don't know if there is any other way of uh, applying for work permit because they should, you need somebody to sponsor it. Like, um, how do you find, why would somebody sponsor you on what basis, right? So I, I see a challenge there. Okay, sir. Okay, thank you. Thank you for the uh, answer. Thank you for that, sir. Thank you. Uh, sir, another question is from uh, Arnab in the chat box. He says, um, I'm pursuing master's in pharmacology. If I want to do higher studies like PhD in Canada, what would be my minimum criteria to join any university or institute there? Is there any entrance examination for PhD in Canada? Well, frankly speaking, I don't have much information on this, but I do know that uh, when I was doing my uh, bridging program in UBC, uh, I had a few people there doing their uh, uh, PhD there. They're all from India. Uh, I, 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 I never asked them how they managed to uh, go there. Um, my understanding was they directly approached the university or somehow they collected the information. But then uh, um, it, is a, it is a question back to you. Uh, what is your plan? after doing the PhD, because there is a reason why I'm asking it. Yeah, so uh, you can put in the chat box, uh, Arnav, or if you want, you can- Oh, he's yourself. in the chat box. It's oh, okay. in the chat box, yeah. So if you want, because you can... now, mm -hmm. go ahead. 
Anna, if you want, you can unmute yourself. I've just given the right to you and ask the question. Arnab, if you are there. Okay, no problem. He says some network issues. So you can put in the okay. chat box. Oh. Okay, so no problem. Anybody else wants to ask any other question to sir? You can raise your hand. I'll, I'll give you the unmuting right. Yes. Or else, if you're not asking, then I'll ask one or two questions and then we can close. Yeah. So nobody has raised. Okay. One question. I am Chetan. So there is another question, sir. I am Chetan mm -hmm. from India. I'm currently pursuing my PhD in pharmaceutics. What opportunities would be available for PhD completed students? Yeah, there's a, this is what I was going to continue on that uh, the previous question from Arnab. Um, that's what I, I wanted to ask him. What, is, what was his plan after completing PhD? Um, frankly speaking, there is not much research going on in Canada. So we don't, we must have seen that there's not many drug manufacturing um, companies here, uh, not much funding for pharmaceutical research. So, um, at least two, at least two students in uh, University of British Columbia, I know, they completed PhD. They took the same exams what I took, and they're working as as pharmacists now, community pharmacists. So um, you have to really, it really uh, plan and see what you want to do after PhD, because there are not much openings here, and there may be few. But in order for you to explore that you have to be here physically present and then dig deeper into it. Yeah. So it can be a bit challenging, yeah. Absolutely. So uh, dear participants, uh, if you have any other questions, please let me know. Uh, you can raise the hand so that I can identify you and give you an option to unmute or else you can also put in the chat box. So, Viral, virology research. Uh, one more question, sir. Any virology research opportunities in Canada? Um, I don't know if there are any any newer any newer research center opened. Um, I have not come across any here. As I said, I am in a, a small remote community working. I don't have much exposure to bigger cities now. I'm far away from. Uh, the major manufacturing hubs like in Toronto or uh, Montreal, um, those other uh, eastern provinces. Um, but even there, there will be very limited. And then, as I said, um, directly applying from India or competing from India can be a bit tricky because um, if the, the company can find a suitable candidate here, they usually don't bother getting the people from outside. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I think this is the situation in almost all the countries now, sir. Uh, every single country they are trying to, you know, have people only from their, uh, you know, local uh, people, right? Local world. Yeah. So the, the 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 thing is that you know people who have immigrated in the past. I mean, even for example, uh, take pharmacists themselves. It's not that everybody got licensed and working as uh, yeah. uh, the pharmacists they all dropped in the middle and uh, shifted to some of these other uh, uh, other jobs, uh, which yeah. doesn't require uh, licensing. So um, it's, it's, it's hard to find. Um, um, you may recall in my previous slide, I have shown that only about 15% of uh, pharmacists, they are working in other areas, but bulk of them, they all in the, in the community and hospital because that's where we are mostly required here. Okay. Okay. All right. Thank you, sir. So uh, there are a few questions on, uh, you know, pharmacovigilance opportunities. And uh, there are a few questions wherein people in India are working as drug safety associates. Uh, mm -hmm. So they want to know if there are opportunities for them as uh, in pharmacovigilance as such in Canada. 
Um, and again, um, there is something called ISMP, Institute for Safe Medication Practice. Um, it's also a smaller organization. So those are some of the places to look for if there are any opportunities or um, even if there are some, what are the requirements? Um, but they're all small because there is no much pharmacovigilance is needed because the day-to-day pharmacy job itself is pharmacovigilance. Yeah. Right? yeah. We are vigilant. We are, we are saving the license of a lot of doctors here because we make sure that before a medication goes into the hands of the people, mm-hmm. um, it's safe and uh, it is what is needed. So uh, no, no much of uh, the pharmacovigilance. Um, in fact, I have not even heard that word that uh, uh, often here. Uh, but there is, there is an organization called ISMP, Institute for Safe Medical Practice, medication practice, I mean to say. Yeah. So that is, that is something to look for. Excellent. So since you are vigilant already, so maybe later the error, chances of errors will be automatically reduced. And Yeah, well, I mean, that's, that's the thing now. You know, um, that's our job. That's our core job. So you can, mm. you can consider that each and every pharmacist who are working in the community, especially, um, they are doing that. <clears throat> yeah, yeah. So we'll take two more questions, not more than that, because so many questions are coming in. Uh, so mm-hmm. one question is, what is the salary for a community pharmacist, minimum and maximum range? Right. So again, it varies. It varies from uh, the place, place to place, province to province, but it can vary somewhere from about 30 to $35 per hour in uh, bigger crowded uh, cities like Vancouver, um, uh, Toronto, Montreal, and those places, and up to 65 to $70 per hour in uh, remote communities. Wow. But okay. then here, um, when we talk of pharmacist salary, you are not supposed to look into only the hourly pay. There are other things we have to look into, the benefits. Yeah. When you talk of benefits, the major, major benefit here is healthcare benefit. Because without health insurance, you just cannot live in this country. The things are so expensive. Yeah. So a lot of companies, almost all the companies, they do provide uh, a fairly good um, the health benefit. But that is something you need to look into as well. And then there are other perks like the bonuses and uh, your uh, leaves. Uh, move-in bonus and sign-on bonus and things like that. I mean, things have changed. The companies are cutting down now because a lot of pharmacies are available. Uh, But still, uh, if you are uh, ready to move to a remote community, uh, there are employers who can pay pay that much. And then you'll get good hours. You know, you can get well over 40 hours um, per week. So those are some of the things you have to look in. Okay, absolutely. Thank you, sir. So one last question I'll take. Uh, any scholarships mm-hmm. for bridging course or any other courses that can help in getting pharmacy license or PR easily in Canada? Um, as such, I have not come across any scholarship programs, but there are banks which are ready to give loans. Um, mm-hmm. That is something you can uh, take advantage of. Some banks, they have a nominal um, interest rate. If you are a very meritorious student and if you put hard work and if you are sure that you can make it with the exams and uh, you can pass and get a job, uh, definitely go for it. I know that it's a big financial commitment, but uh, yeah, uh, those those options are there. Yeah. You, can, you can avail those uh, loans, but um, I have not come across any scholarship programs because I was looking into Alberta, which I started only this year. Uh, BC, there is no scholarship program. Um, Ontario, it's kind of, um, it's a bit complicated. But even there, I did not come across any scholarship program. Um, there is one in Quebec, uh, but Quebec is one province, I don't know how many of you know, which is, though it is within Canada, it operates differently. It is the only province which is purely, purely French speaking. 
um so most of the most of the immigrants they don't look forward to go there unless if you're fluent in french um so i don't know how many of you are interested there but otherwise that is another province where they made the bridging program mandatory um but um, yeah i i, I wouldn't uh, bank on scholarship programs for these programs yeah thank you so much for that sir so anyways lot of information is available online these days and um, i'm sure yeah. participants have access to every information today so just in case uh, you are willing to plan to shift to canada and you have decided on your mind and financially you are you have thought of your plans uh, do connect with me and uh, i'm sure you'll have re- received an email from me earlier uh, this today and yesterday also do send an email to me or connect with me and then i'll see if i can connect with uh, nitesh sir for further help but sure then, sure uh, thank you so much for that sir uh, but then please do connect only if you are serious and you have definitely planned the, to go there and not just for you know getting information and asking the you know queries and doubts because we we can save lot of time there okay and for any other uh, information online options are available and the recording of this video also will be shared with you so you can watch multiple times and clarify uh, any other questions or final you know round of thoughts anybody wants to share please raise your hand uh, i'll just unmute you you want to interact with nitesh sir finally then go on before we close the session for today anil sir if you want to interact if you want just raise your hand let me know so that i can uh, give you the option to unmute okay so otherwise no problem so thank you so much guys for being part of this session nitesh sir uh, my heartfelt thanks to you you know i have taken your saturday <laughs> early morning oh, no, no worries <laughs> it's no already problem. i think 220 am on saturday <laughs> right? yeah yeah my my saturday is tomorrow actually it is a um, friday evening uh, friday, friday evening night program. friday yeah. night 220 am okay so yeah, thank no, you it's, so uh, 12 15 here <laughs> 12 15 in the night so yeah thank you so much for spending uh, so much of time with us sir and sharing your experience and expertise and also you know enlightening um, our participants with uh, so much of information and clarifying their doubts of course and definitely we'll have one more session wherein it will be purely a q and a session because i have already more than 60 plus questions waiting for you know your answers i'll send a sheet to you later on and then sure. we'll see if we can have a email communication or if we need if you are okay we can have one just q and a session just like that oh yeah so. i'm open for any any <laughs> format yeah no problem yeah <laughs> thank you I'll so go much go through all the thank questions so and uh, yeah no worries it's my pleasure <laughs> thank you thank you so much sir so participant thank you so much for your time and uh, just in case you want to uh, attend the next session which will be on health economics and outcomes research heor from one of the speakers from iqvia so this will be on uh, upcoming upcom- friday or saturday uh, i'll get more information and update in the groups so stay tuned and um, have a wonderful weekend ahead so thank you so much all thank you nitesh sir and i wish you have a wonderful uh, weekend thank you so much participants and uh, yeah thank you so much manager you are doing a great job keep doing <laughs> So thank you. yeah yeah it's highly appreciable. Thank you so much sir just doing my bit sir whatever possible. Oh yeah no you you are doing <laughs> such a great job. No highly thank commendable. You, thank you so thank much. Thank you sir. Thank you sir. All and right. participants please share your feedback also and suggest for next topics that you want to listen to and I'll connect with uh, you know respective industry leaders and see if we can have some conversation there. So thank you so much all thank you so much Nitesh sir and I wish you all have a wonderful you know we can stay safe stay food, stay good yeah thank you